If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn now to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Last week we read all of this chapter. This week we will just really focus on one verse. I want to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting to see, as you go back, as, as I've read this and meditated on it and thought it through, and I see what, as I read, and I, I can, uh, sometimes I, I get a sense uh, of what, what the apostle must have been dealing with and how he must have been uh, feeling as he writes this uh, this letter. He, had, uh, he was writing, you can obviously tell that he's writing out of a sense of pain, of anguish, uh, because uh, the people that he loved uh, have, um, uh, have in some ways turned against him. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is a theme that the commentators through the centuries have, have picked up and have, uh, have been very perceptive in talking about how uh, many times the Christian would like to think that all problems disappear, that life becomes nothing but uh, sweetness, and, and uh, that uh, you know all, all is well. And in one sense, there is truth to that, because as the songwriter said, it is well with my soul, even though the storms around me are, are going strongly, even though the winds of life blow against me, it is, it is well with my soul. But in another area, we want to say that the Bible is very clear that when we live life, life can sometimes be difficult, and we have to confess and admit that before we can tackle it. Uh, first, or Second Corinthians, rather, 1.8 says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. It's better to be knowledgeable than stupid, right, Steve? <laughs> For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even to life. Now, there's some other areas where he's under under uh, stress and he's suffered depression, but this is a good verse just to, to summarize what, what he has went through about his trouble, that he was burdened beyond measure, above strength, even to the point where they despaired of their life. We look and we see that, as we mentioned last, as I mentioned last week, the constant theme of our church is that the gospel is good news. It is good news. Things are getting better and better. Not only are we saved as individuals with our personal salvation, testified to by the presence of the Holy Spirit, but uh, but the world itself is being redeemed. Um, every week, I try to, I didn't this week, but each week I try to include something in your bulletin that, that dispels the myth uh, started within, within Christianity itself. Uh, perhaps even dating back to Malthusus, who was a Christian minister, saying that the world was going to be overpopulated and starved to death and resources were going to run out. And, and now the world runs with that. And now you have secular prophets like Al Gore proclaiming the end of the earth when nothing like that is to, is to be found. Uh, we find that things around the world on a general basis are getting better and better. God is doing greater and greater things. His kingdom is growing. Uh, uh, there is, a, If you look at Acts, uh, the book of Acts, you find that there, are, uh, that there is famines all around. And today, the only famines that we have in terms of, uh, in terms of reality uh, are political famines. When... When governments are tyrannical and they don't want you to eat, they'll starve you to death. But it's not because there's a lack of food. Food is rotting in the docks in some countries. They just they just don't feed you. So so God and, and God will deal with those with those tyrants. There will come a time when uh, when when they will bow before the Lord and God will continue to deliver the, the earth. He delivered us from a great from from a great death individually, and He delivers us uh, in terms of the earth. Uh, through the renewing of our mind, for the transformation of who we are. And the world is, is becoming a new creation. And, and frankly, as we talked about in the past, it is becoming a better creation than it was, than it was even in Eden. We know that Jesus Christ is a far more glorious second Adam, and we know that everything in him is more glorious the second time around. So we always think in terms of paradise being, you know, being, you know, the, the first creation, and it was good. In fact, God looked out and said, it is very good. But we find that with the, the advent of the second creation that takes place under and through Jesus Christ, everything even becomes more spectacularly better. It's like there used to be an old covenant, and 
that old covenant was glorious. But that glory passed away, and today we have an ever more glorious covenant. So things are getting better, more glorious. But we also realize that while we have to acknowledge and testify to all the areas of life that lead to, as we've talked about, that lead to uh, rejoicing and feasting, as we're going to do today, we also have to realize that we can't gloss over the fact that there are times that weeping endures for a night. I mentioned last week that while the forests are thriving, this doesn't imply that individual trees are not dying from disease or from uh, lack of care or sometimes from stress. So uh, when we look around and we say, when we say that things are getting better, that doesn't necessarily mean that every individual is, is, is doing better. There are times, there are, there are situations when, when people are hurting, when there's, when there's stresses, when there's, when there is, uh, when there's problems. And so we, we, we don't want to gloss over that and say, oh, you just have to give, you just have to give yourself a, a positive view on life and you know, it'll all take care of itself. The Word of God never glosses over the hardships of life. These hardships and trials are brought about in several ways. First, there's hardships and disappointments of just being born into the world that's not yet been fully redeemed. While death will one day be placed under the feet of Christ and destroyed, it's still our raging enemy. We lose loved ones. And pain can be powerful and, and seemingly unbearable in those situations. Is when a husband loses a wife or a wife loses a husband. I, I don't know if you've ever talked to someone uh, that maybe they've been married for 50 years and their, their, their husband or their wife has just passed away. And, and you can see that it affects them. In fact, many times uh, when, when someone's been married 50 or 60 years and they're, they're in great health, but if their spouse dies and, 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 and goes before them, that, that very soon thereafter, it seems like the will to live or, or something is taken out of them, and you see that they go to be with the Lord as well. It's, it's a difficult thing. It is difficult to see those things. Or we look around and we see a baby who dies shortly after birth, or when like a young boy on my son's hockey team, uh, that they're stricken at 12 years old, stricken with life-ending cancer. I remember a friend of mine that uh, I worked with, Lloyd Wheeler, uh, uh, had been married for 50, 60 years. Uh, uh, was it 50, 60 years or something, wasn't it, Val? And, and, um, and at the end of her life, she, his wife was stricken with Alzheimer's. And I never seen uh, a, a more painful scenario because even though she was alive, uh, Lloyd uh, handled it very well. Uh, even when, when she didn't know who her, her children were, uh, when, even when she would walk out in downtown Marshall and and, and walk out, uh, you know, and the police would find her, or he'd find out, and they'd, they'd bring her back home. Uh, he handled all of that well. But then one day, he woke up, and she didn't even know who he was. And, and it was a devastating thing. He was wiped out, because never in his wildest imagination, even though people had told him about it, and they said, be prepared for this, when his wife, of all these years, looked at him and did not know who he was, it was something that devastated him. All these things just happened. It's not... It happens because we are living life. I, I was watching a, a, a part of a movie the other day. It was a Lethal Action 4. Uh, I don't know what it's rated, so don't look. I, I don't know. But I was, I was reading that. I was watching that. And, and in, in it, Mel Gibson uh, is uh, the section I came in on. I'd never seen it before. And I was watching it. And, and he's in the ring with this young guy now, Mel Gibson. You know, by the it's kind of like Rocky movies. You know, by the time you get to Rocky 17, you know, Rocky's like 400 years old. Well, like, you know, in Lethal Action 1, Mel Gibson can be the, you know, the, you know, the, the fighting, you know, guy that never loses. But by Lethal Action 4, he's a little bit older. And, uh, and in it, he's, they, I see, I came in the movie and he's, and he's in the ring with a young boxer. And he's trying to box the guy. And the guy is just cleaning his clock, just beating the daylights out of him. And all of a sudden you hear, uh, you hear Mel Gibson go, oh, I, I can't lift my shoulder, my shoulder. And he, and he walks out of the ring and, you know, and, and uh, his, his buddy is there with him. And uh, grabs him and and he, and he takes him into the into the locker room and, and he's and he's working with him. He says, "Here, let me take care of that shoulder." And Mel Gibson looks up and he says, "Oh, my shoulder's fine." He goes, "What are you talking about?" He says, "He says I was just getting the daylight speed out of me in there." And uh, he got and his uh, I can't remember his his cop friend said said to him, "Well, you know, we're getting older." And uh, oh, I'm sorry. And Mel says, "You know, something is something's going on." He said, "Like like the uh, the crook that I just chased him." He says, "I've never let him. I've never let a criminal get away in a foot race." His partner says, you know, it's happening to all of us. We're all getting older. And Mel Gibson says, no, I'm, I'm not going to let it happen. I'm just not going to let it happen. And then he starts chanting, I'm not getting old. I'm not getting old. And he 
pretty soon he gets his, his friend chanting. And so for five minutes of their chanting, I'm not getting the hold. It's not happening to me. The reality is, is it is happening to him. And it's happening to us. It's happening to everyone. Life happens. And we come up with disappointments and changes. And, and, and I remember I remember the first time that, that uh, as I was, I was trying to read, and I've never had any problems, and all of a sudden I'm looking at letters, and they're, they're getting fuzzy, and, and I'm starting to go back a little bit, and, and I blame it on the light. And I'm like, man, the light in here is bad. And when I take a red of light, I still can't see. And, and then finally I have to get these glasses. And, and, it's, and, uh, and, you know, and then my wife laughs at me and, and tells me I'm getting old. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and life happens. And, and it, you know what? It, it bothers you. I don't know if it just, it's like, okay, this, I haven't accomplished what I wanted to do. I haven't, so disappointments, pressures, and this isn't anything like what the apostles do, but we know that life happens. There are, there are some things that just transpire. In another vein, divorce can devastate a devout and faithful Christian, and, and frankly, even their children. Um, in fact, many times, more often the children, when a spouse or a parent decides to end a marriage. The pain, the confusion... The burden of increased responsibilities can press down to the point of despairing for life. Then there are those times of trials that come about as a result of your faith in God. 2 Timothy 3.12 states that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This can come from outside the Christian faith. This is seen in such countries as Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan uh, or um, all any other Islamic countries, or perhaps in China, or uh, Tibet, or other countries where they are, where they are actively uh, persecuting Christians. And you can be imprisoned, or you can actually die for your faith. In Islamic countries, you can be beheaded or taxed to death. Uh, in, in Paul's case, however, we find that his greatest sufferings, uh, in terms of his mental anguish, not talking about the physical sufferings, but as he writes to the Corinthians, you get a sense that it's not the physical beatings, as bad as they are from non-Christians, that's weighing him down. You get a sense that it's the Christians that are treating him in such a way that, that, would, that would despise him, that really is weighed on him. So we look here, we see that, that in Paul's case, uh, even though his physical sufferings have been numerous, they've been intense, they've been painful, we find that it's those within the church, the false apostles, who've led foolish believers astray, and they've literally, uh, they've literally abandoned the one who had given them their, his life to lead them to Christ. Paul, we find, had suffered betrayal and abandonment at the hands of his brothers in the Lord. He had his motives questioned, his integrity challenged, his physical appearance mocked, and his authority scoffed at, all by those whom he had sacrificed much to bring the faith. Now, I'm not going to cover the persecutions that come because we sin or because we're foolish, Outside of saying that God does chastise those whom he loves and that the sufferings we receive in those cases are not persecutions. Those are more like uh, the sufferings a child receives when he, when, he, uh, when he receives a spanking, when he disobeys. Uh, they can be avoided by obedience and not by living an obnoxious life. Uh, the prayer that we pray during those times is the same that David prayed after sinning gravely. Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But the point here is that while we rejoice and we celebrate... In the good news, we also know that we're living life, and life on many occasions is difficult, it's hurtful, it's disappointing. How many of you ever have been hurt? How many of you ever come up with difficult situations? Or how many of you have ever experienced something that's been incredibly painful as a Christian? And we might say this, at the hands of another Christian. Okay? Again, one of the things that the Bible talks about is the Bible elevates the church. It says that the church is the bride of Christ. It is, it is the crown jewel uh, on earth. It is, it, is, it, is, it is what Christ died for. But never does it say that the church in itself is perfect because it can't be. Because it's filled with, with you and I. Okay, so as, as, we're, as we're dealing one with another, many times we find that the greatest hurts come from those within the church. We find that our greatest disappointments come from when, when perhaps religious leaders fail us. Or perhaps other uh, Christians fail us, or or when we or, or when they betray us, or or when that there's we, we find in the church that Paul has to talk about you know don't be tailbearers, don't be backbiters, uh, don't be don't be running around creating strife within the church. We find that that happens in the church. We have to what Paul is 
saying is he's saying, listen, I understand this stuff. When I write to you about this stuff, I know I'm experiencing the pain. I've experienced the humiliation. I've experienced the rejection. Not from the world. I expect that. But I've experienced it at your hands. You guys know that I have birthed you. I've brought, I've brought about your conversion or I led you to the faith. And, and, now, and now I come in and, and not only do you reject me, but now you even laugh at my appearance. You'll find that the apostles, one of the things, or the, the, the false uh, apostles, that's what they did. They said, he's a short, ugly, shrill-sounding guy. Why would you listen to him? That's what they were saying. They're saying, he's, he's holding you in a bucket of guts, my dad may have said. You know, his voice, it's not the smooth, baritone-type voice of, of perhaps some leaders. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't carry himself with the, you know, the, the height and the stature of maybe, maybe some other leaders. They said, "Look at him." I mean, they're. I mean, you get to the point where they're mocking even your physical appearance when, when you have, when, when half the reason you look like that is because you've been beaten with rods, you've been shipwrecked, you've been, uh, you've been imprisoned. I mean, all these things. And, and so he's he's sitting here and he, he knows real pain. And there's, there's no sense here of him trying to gloss this over and say, oh, no big deal. It doesn't bother me. It bothers him big time. You know, one of the ways that he deals with it is he acknowledges that this bothers him big time. You know, if we walk around saying, it doesn't bother me, no big deal, then we'll never have reconciliation. We'll never have, we'll never, we'll never grow in, in grace. We'll never deal with these things. But we, he just says, listen, this is a, this is a problem. But... So even while we rejoice and we celebrate in good news, we know that we're living life. But Paul, and all the other writers of Scripture, is not afraid to confront this reality. He does so by clearly stating that while we live in earthen vessels, and there are times that we can even despair for our life, that in weakness, the Spirit of God gives us strength. In danger, God delivers. Facing death, Christ provides His resurrection, life in the Spirit. Samson in Judges 15 and 16, you'll find an interesting, interesting uh, <clears throat> parallel here. Uh, I never would have made the connection. I was reading John Calvin has a whole section on, on Paul's being pressed down beyond measure or, or almost like beyond measure and despairing for his life. And, uh, and, and, and he, and he uh, quotes Chrysostom, who's you know, 300 years before, or I should say about 1,000 years before him. And they, they go back to Samson, and they, they point out Samson, as Samson is, uh, his own people uh, are, are binding him. 3,000 of his own people come out in, in, uh, in Judges chapter 3, and they take Samson hostage. They come out and say, hey, listen, uh, the Philistines over here, we're under their rule, and they're, they're really ticked at us, and unless we give you uh, to them, uh, they're, you know, they're going to go on a rampage against us. And Samson said, if you look in there, he says, listen, as long as you pledge to me that you will not kill me by your own hands, I'll go with you. He says, I'll, I'll, let, you take, I'll let you take me to them. And so they bind him, it says, with strong, brand new rope. It said that they take him out and they hand him over to the Philistines. Now, I want you to think about this. I mean, they're there. I mean, he has been a judge of Israel. He has protected them. And they're turning over one of their homegrown heroes filled with the spirit of the Lord. They're going to hand him over to the enemy. I mean, you want to think about a, a time of betrayal, but, but here it is. What happens is, is that, uh, that the spirit, the word of God says that in the midst of this, now I know that, you know, with all the cartoons and everything that we see, Samson is always this, this monster guy. He's probably got a physique like me and he's strong and he's, he's you know, he's, he's going after his enemies, but really we don't know what his, you know, what it looked like, but we know that his strength didn't come because he was a weightlifter, right? We know that it didn't come because he was able to do push-ups or sit-ups or, or that, he, that he worked on a regular basis. We know that God from birth had called him to a certain thing, that God, the Spirit of God was upon him and given him the strength. We know that's because on, a, on regular occasions, it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And at this point, when he's being handed over to the enemies, the Word of God says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he broke the, he broke the ropes, he broke the bondage, and, he, and, he, and basically he destroyed his enemies. He destroyed a thousand enemies. He is, he is surrounded by enemies. He is pressed down on every side, and yet the Spirit of God came on him, and he was able to break through and defeat them. Now, in, in Judges chapter 16... The Philistines 
peoples that surround him in Gaza, one of their cities. But he picks up the gates. The word of God says he picks up the gates and the pillars of the gates because they've surrounded him. They're laid in wait. He does, and they've, they've, they've blocked off all of his ways. And he picks up the gates and he walks off with it. This says, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here. They surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night saying, in the morning when it is daylight, we will kill him. Now, remember, I want, we're gonna, this is going to come home in just a second. But I want you to think of something. He is... He is, he could be in despair even of his life. He looks around. The city is surrounded. There's thousands of them waiting for him. There's no way out. And yet Samson goes and in, in the morning, in the morning light, says he took hold of the doors and the gate of the city and two gate posts. He just went out there. He says they They've got me locked in. I don't know how to get up. He goes out and he grabs the gates of the city and he lifts them up and there's two gate posts that are holding it down and he, and he pulls a bar and all it says and he put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now this is a burden and a weight that could not be borne by him in a natural sense. It had to come through the presence and power of God to sustain him. Again, I mentioned John Calvin, the great theologian of the 1500s. He expanded on this in linking Samson's supernatural success under what would be unbearable pressure. I mean, think about this. When Paul says we're facing pressures, it's just we think it's unbearable. And in myself, I couldn't do it. I would despair to life. But he says, but if you remember what Paul says, Paul says the way that I overcome these things is that when I know that I'm weak, God is strong. When I cannot bear it up, then the Holy Spirit will come and make a way where there is no way. When I am not able to, when I'm not able to, to look at life and desire to go a step farther, the Holy Spirit is able to come and say, listen, I am here to give you life and life more abundantly. And I'll make a way for you to do that. So he picks it up and he walks under, under what would normally be unbearable pressure. And that's what Paul is saying about being in despair for his life. When Samson forgot that it was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon him to allow him to be victorious against all the odds, when he, was, when, when he had to face the pressures of life without God, he found himself blinded and reduced to a slave. One of the saddest sections of Scripture is found in Judges 16, in Judges 16, verse 20, where Samson is under siege by his enemies. If you remember, Delilah comes up and she cuts his hair. And, uh, and, and she says, Samson, the Philistines are upon thee. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before as at other times and shake myself free. See, he had forgot that he was operating all those other times. It wasn't because he had muscles. It wasn't because he was working out. It was always because the Spirit of God had been upon him. He says, I'm going to shake myself free. But here's the saddest, I think this may be the, one of the saddest sections of Scripture we know of follows. It says, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. All of a sudden, Samson was going to face maybe the, the loss of life by himself. His enemies were there, pressing down on him. And for the first time, he looked around and he realized that there was no hope because he was pressed on every side, but God had left him. It is the presence of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, that Paul was speaking of when he wrote in chapter 4. He said, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will be present, uh, will present us with you. In other words, the Apostle Paul said, when I look around and I am pressed down on every side, when I am perplexed even to the point of death, when I am in despair even of my life, he said, at that time I realized that in my weakness, I would never be able to face these problems anyway. I'd never be able to deal with a friend who betrayed me. I'd never be able to deal with, with, with being surrounded without a, an exit. I'd never be able to go up and grab the gates of the city and carry a burden to the top of the hill and drop it off. I would never be able to do any of those things. But, he said, when I understand my weakest point, 
But I realized that I, would, I have never been able to handle any of it, even the best of times I could handle it on my own. He said, it's in my weakness that I realize that God is made strong and God is glorified. And that's when he said, Jesus is going, the one who raised up Jesus is going to raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Let me just share with you what he's saying here. He's saying that when you look around and, when, and remember, the context of this is Paul said, I've been betrayed by you guys. And when I come to the point, when I come to the point of despair, he said, I just realized that, hey, listen, it's not my gospel anyway, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not your creator. God is your creator. I don't draw my satisfaction ultimately from you. I receive it from the presence of the Lord. My validation doesn't come from others. It comes from Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, chapter 31 through 39, it says this. So what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not be not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? I want you not to just read this in the vacuum. This is Paul is writing to the Romans, but I want you to think about his experience. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? As someone, as someone that you know, if they, if they, if they lied about you, have any of you ever been lied about by someone that you? You know, there's people that, that can lie about you don't care. Then there's other people that somehow or another, something happens. Isn't it? Does that happen to you? It can, it, there's times when you can go, well, man, where do I do? What can I do? But Paul said, Paul said, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? People laugh at you, scoff at you, abandon you. Remember last week we talked about Paul being abandoned? He got thrown in prison. Demas had been with him. Paul was counting on him for friendship, for support. And he writes and he says, Demas has forsaken me. Demas has left me. Maybe some of you have been left by a husband or a wife. You went through a divorce, and during tough times you thought, hey, I can count. I can count for support on my husband. I can count for support on my wife. And, 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 and during whatever it is, whether it's good times or bad, all of a sudden they bail out. They decide that they love something or someone more than you. Paul said, Demon has forsaken me. I'm here in prison all by myself. If you read it, it's, if you read it, there's almost, there's almost a sense, of, it's, it's, it's not pathetic, but you, you, you can sense Paul. Paul says, come quickly to me. Send someone, send my books. I don't even have any books to keep me comfortable. Bring my cloak. I'm cold in prison. I'm, a, I'm abandoned. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been through a divorce. I know what, what it feels like to be abandoned. I mean, one day... Everything is good. The next day, it's not good. Some of you may have felt like that. How do you, how do you deal with that? You're, you're pressed down to the point where you despair. An investment has been made emotionally, economically, and all these things. And all of a sudden, it's just, it seems like, you know, someone that you love says, I don't love you. Goodbye. How do you deal with that? Well, you can say, well, it doesn't bother me. No big deal. That's what I tried to do, and I realized that it was a big deal. I was lying. It was painful. It hurt. You turn to the Lord. You say, Lord, I don't know if I can go on. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I'm despairing in every area of my life. And yet, the Word of God says that when we're weak, when we think that there is no hope, when there are charges brought against you that are false, and you don't know where to turn, you can turn to God because God is the one who fights for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? 
He is the one in your weakness that you will be made strong. It is, it is something that is perhaps indescribable, as the Apostle Paul would say, but it is very real. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is God who died and therefore, and furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God the Father, of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are come as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life, nor death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Apostle Paul says, in the midst of all this, when I have weathered the persecutions, when I have weathered the, when I have weathered your mocking, when I have, when I have been accused of being a false apostle, when I have, when I have been scoffed at and, and even beaten, he said, when I come to the point where I don't think I can handle it anymore, when I think that it is better just to give up, he said, I realize that that's the point where God can be glorified in and through me if I turn to him. We carry about these things, he says, in earthen vessels. It's going to hit each and every one of us. The point is, Paul is saying that God is greater than all those things. And by the way, we go through this. You'll find that what the Apostle Paul says during this is then he comes back and he says, you know, I want to tell you something. He said, I wrote you a tough letter in the first one. He said, I want to commend you. In a great many areas, you guys have stepped up to the plate. You have listened. You have, in, in, in places where you dishonored me, you, you honored me. He said, so even Paul, even as he pours up his heart, he realized that God is doing a work among the very people that have turned against him. You know, many times we want to take out our frustrations on those who have caused us some pain. Paul identifies the ones that he says causing pain. But ultimately, he knew that it was only God himself that could change it around. The Word of God says that we pray for our enemies. We bless those that despitefully use us. Paul could have said, I'm writing you guys off. But he didn't. He says, I pray for you constantly. You cause me mental anguish. But I will pray for you at all times. The challenge today is what do we do in our pain? What happens when we come up against persecutions and trials? Do we look finally look to God and say, God, I'm despairing of all life, but I know that you can take me through this. I know that you can fill me with your spirit. I know that you can encourage me. And that even though others may be bringing false cases against me, you yourself are my intercessor. I don't think you are for me, you can be against me. Do we also turn and say, okay, this is a time when I can actually act out the Christian life. I can bless those who persecute me. I can pray for those who despitefully use me. When you do that, you are showing the grace and the love and the power of God through your life. It is at those times of uh, persecution, those times of pain, that we can most readily... And by the way, let me close with this. It's kind of interesting. I was reading Charles Hodge wrote a great section on pain and suffering. He said, one thing that Christians have to understand is that pain and suffering do not make you holy. It just leads to pain and suffering. This is a guy that wrote 100, 200 years ago, I guess it was, right now. He said, pain and suffering only, only is a benefit to you when you understand what to do with it. And that you act in a Christian manner with it. He said, simply to sit there and take pain and suffering and to think that somehow that's something that's making you a better person... He said, you're crazy. That's just a bunch of pain and suffering for nothing. He said, what you need to do is you need to take the pain and suffering that you're experiencing. Ask God to work through you. And then to utilize that in actions that will glorify Him. And that will lead to victorious Christian life. Amen. It's easy to say. It's tough to do. I don't think anybody here would like to be abandoned by friends that were to prove this up. I don't think anybody here would like to have pain inflicted on you just so that you can see. But the 
point here is, is that all of us, because we live life, we're going to face problems. We're going to face pain. We're going to face defeat. We're going to face things that aren't so great. The Bible never says you're going to escape those simply because you become a Christian. It, says, it just says that those things are going to lead to life, where for the world and non-believers, they just lead to ultimate despair and death itself. As Joshua would say, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close in prayer?